Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Coming up, Tony Award winning director Matthew Warchus. But first, we're going to talk about last night's Tony ceremony. We are joined tonight by my good friend Michael Musto of the Village Voice, who skipped the Tony <laughs> Awards this year, Michael. I but JFK said it was great. It was great. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just having an Alice Ripley moment. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Musto of the Village Voice. We are also joined by Jesse Green of New York Magazine. Welcome back to Theater Talk, Jesse. Thank you. And my old friend Patrick Pacheco, who was working the red carpet at the Tony you Awards bet. for New York One on stage. And you also occasionally file for the Los Angeles Times, a bankrupt newspaper. I do. I do. <laughs> Welcome to Theater Talk. Uh, all right, Michael, on the whole, was this Tony Award ceremony, the telecast, the show itself, any better or any worse than it has been in years past? Well, the ratings are up, believe it or not. And From I think it's point zero one to <laughs> yeah. point zero it doubled two. to 30 people. Because <laughs> Tale of Two Cities wasn't nominated, so the cast of 80 got to sit home and watch. watch <laughs> Some of them were Nielsen families. But no, it, it was okay. It started with a kind of mishmash opening number where Sakura Channing looked like a drag queen and kind of duetted with the guy from Next to Normal for no reason. I know that did look and like... none of this was explained to the public. Yeah, I mean, Sakura was out there in, in, a, in, a, in a fur coat, and all of a sudden it looked like a stagehand came wandering out in his t-shirt to dance with her. But if you stuck it out, which I did, there were elevating moments like Angela Lansbury adding some dignity and Jerry Herman and Neil Patrick Harris I thought was cute as a host. He's like Hugh Jackman light. And he, mm -hmm. all through the show, I'm like, why doesn't he get to sing? And he finally did at the end in a very funny recap yes, song he was of the wonderful. whole show. Yeah, I can't with be. lyrics like, this show couldn't be gayer if Liza were mayor and Elton John <laughs> took flight. Well, that was Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman. <laughs> Who wrote the, the yes. lyrics. Yeah. A highlight of the show for you, Jesse? Did you get around to watching it or uh, you don't care I anymore? forgot. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, did something happen? <laughs> but I thought the whole thing was pretty good. Yeah. Um, and considering how many great shows there were and you couldn't get all of them in, they managed to do a respectful job of the musicals. Of yeah. course, the treatment of the plays left something to be desired. Yes, I must say, I thought uh, there was some controversy before the Tonys began about uh, uh, the CBS not telecasting the best uh, the award for best revival of a play, but in the end, they bowed to they pressure came. from the New York Post uh, <laughs> and agreed to have that award on. But I did think, Patrick, that the plays, and this was a great year, a great year for non-musical plays, they were still given short shrift. I mean, a couple of cast members talk a little bit about the play, and then they have a 20-second spot, and that's 20 it. 20 seconds? It was like, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> There's the shiny. <laughs> it's an intractable problem. I mean, they've been struggling with this same problem, you know, since they started telecasting the Tonys. Because how how do you give enough time to contextualize a scene? You know, there's just not enough room. I think it's going to be an intractable problem for the rest of it. And this is geared toward entertainment. And obviously, people musicals are a lot easier. People follow them perhaps more. They're more certainly more conversant with West Side Story and Pal Joey and other uh, shows. Do we really and need legal, a, a scene from Legally Blonde, uh, which is now on tour, but was not nominated for a Tony the first time around? But yeah, many but members of the league or, of, or yeah. the other or the wing are road producers, so yeah. they have it, to be accommodated I as well. Actually, the low point were the scenes from the touring companies, because yes. they proved that, or maybe the point was to prove that, hey, here on Broadway, <laughs> we get the good production. And we've got all the Because the number from Mamma Mia was <laughs> like a really bad high school production with old people and the Jersey Boys thing that closed out the show was just pitiful. Well, I, I, I bet it I, sold a lot of tickets though. I bet it sold a lot of tickets for I think Jersey there were a lot Boys. of phone calls to the box office but to cancel. Uh, Jesse, I heard you on the radio today making a, an interesting point about this year's winners. Um, really, not since the, the heyday of Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh have the British dominated Broadway the way they have this year. I think something like 18 of the 24 awards went to British productions so, and British artists. I made no such point on any radio show anywhere in the country. <laughs> <laughs> but it is interesting. Thank no, you. it seems to me you made that point in your column today, that little sidebar. They I thought I'd stolen it from Jesse. <laughs> you know, the point I may have made, and although I'll take yours. Um, considering how many shows were nominated, quite a number of shows got a little bit of the gravy in, in this case. There's 17 top categories, leaving aside the design <laughs> categories that no one knows about. And I think, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 different shows got some awards. That's, that's But everything good. was so shocking in its predictability. Yes, yeah. Pretty much everything that we and all the other pundits said were going to win 
won. I mean, we long for the years when there was an Adina Menzel, a Lashans, just something out of left field, hey, so that there the was insiders the watching, who are the only people watching, there could get was, a little rise. There was the surprise of next to normal winning for best score. Not, and Elton not didn't a, look happy. The, yes. <laughs> no, but Elton John was very gracious. He wrote the score, of course, to Billy Elliot. He did not win for Billy Elliot, but he was very gracious when Billy Elliot won the award for best musical. And he, he Well, that was three hours later, and he had time to think about it and probably be coached by his boyfriend, the producer, David Furnish. <laughs> you better act gracious because you're looking like a scowling nightmare. <laughs> oh my God. I think your, your I visa to England has just been canceled. I hope so. You're, you're not going to his, uh, what's that, his, his A's charity party this year in the estate, I don't mm. think. Yeah. Right, Patrick, you, you want to make a point? Do, <laughs> uh, I think the fact that 17 of the awards went to non-American plays and productions is just simply a reflection of the Billy Elliot juggernaut. I think, though, that the British theater is is very very strong right now, and with the, the you know the the Donmar Warehouse and the Almeida Theater and the National Theater, uh, these very good nonprofit theaters over there with a lot of terrific actors and a lot it's a, a lot less expensive to do shows over there to begin them there. Without these shows, Broadway would be a fairly empty place. Yes, you but I think there's also a certain snobbery that the pr producers are very happy to take trips over to London to see the good stuff here. Uh, well, what's wrong with that? There. There's good stuff but in London. You have, for instance since the play Ruined, the best play of the season, I think we all agree, which couldn't get on to Broadway because they simply can't be bothered to put their money or their energy, like you, who would rather go to a play in London than a play on Forest Street. I'm afraid too many of the producers are, are guilty of that. And Susan, so the, Susan the, the, the sadly American hasn't been stuff. to London in a long time, so she has a lot of <laughs> anger Americans. and resentment that she doesn't get to travel anymore. But a Jesse? good case in point here, let's talk about Reasons to be Pretty, which had mm -hmm. posted its closing notice today didn't get any awards. Uh, many right. people felt it was among the best plays. It was nominated and certainly had every reason to uh, be in among the other plays, I think. Didn't we all agree on that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and the excerpt they showed, showed was amazing. You F word. That was it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but that's, Neil Labute has often produced his plays in England first. He didn't uh -huh. in this case, and this is what happened. I, I think you're right, Michael. No, I think had that show, for instance, begun in London, maybe it would have come here with a different kind of vibe around it and, and not ended up on the bottom of the pile of these four excellent plays. But I plays. think the affinity for British theater was shown when they announced Janet McTeer and showed Harriet Walter and vice versa. <laughs> what are you jealous <laughs> of here, Harriet Michael? Walker. Without the British theater now, uh, the New York theater scene would be, I think, pretty pathetic. No, I think that's all very well and good, but I do think that there should be more scouting out there in the hinterlands of America. God to support bless America. <laughs> yes. But, yes. But, but, yeah, but I mean, in, in, this all th goes in cycles. I mean, yes, they may have the Donmar and, and all these other wonderful theaters, the Almeida, but we have the Goodman and we have the Roundabout. And, and from the, the Goodman MTC. came Desire Under the Elms and, that well, lasted four days. Yes, well, whatever it is in other seasons, <laughs> we these have white provide Christmas. a lot of the <laughs> We <laughs> have Shrek. Relax, we're fun. doing good. I like Shrek. <laughs> Go to London and all that's playing in London theaters are American shows. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, let's uh, just jump ahead though because we are closing the book on the past season <laughs> and looking ahead. We've got a few things percolating in yeah. the summer. Patrick, Jesse, Michael, what are you guys going to be, what are you looking out for? Well, we're all hoping that Fela will uh, come to Broadway after yeah. it's yeah, off-Broadway The, the terrific uh, off-Broadway uh, musical about <laughs> Fela Kuti. Although it's about an, uh, an African subject. Mm -hmm. It's by an American artist, so there you go. Yeah. Um, and uh, in the coming season, there's Catch Me If You Can. Which uh, is? Uh, the music, new musical based on the Tom Hanks, Leonardo DiCaprio movie with a score by uh, Shaman. Mark Shaman and, and uh, Scott Whitman. Which tries out in Seattle this summer. This summer. summer. Yeah. And uh, a new David Mamet play in the fall, which nobody seems to know what it's about. Race. I Race. Think that's, that's what, what we know. That's, that's what it's about. <laughs> and Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah, and Spider-Man. Uh, well, what do you make of Spider-Man, Michael? Because we're going to be talking about this. It's a $40 million cartoon musical directed by Julie Taymor. I'm getting comps, so I'm not worried about <laughs> that. that. But uh, I don't know, Bono mixed with puppets and maybe Evan, Rachel Wood, Alan Cumming. I'll be there. And there's The Wiz this summer as well that I'm looking forward to. And Bye Bye Birdie is being revived as well, isn't yeah, it? Well, this is another yeah. reason why American theaters, nonprofit theaters, are in the terrible state they're in because they're reviving things like Bye Bye Birdie and they're not doing exciting new work as the British theaters are doing. Like Mamma Mia. <laughs> like Mamma Mia. And Mary Stewart. <laughs> exactly. And, and the Norman like, Conquest. Yeah. That's a wonderful play. Uh, yes, wonderful but production. it's a revival. Some, but some things are wonderful. But brilliantly rethought by Matthew Warchus coming up on Theater Talk. <laughs> <laughs> I hope they fix the book to fella. 
because that was the Fela. Yes, it was Fela. Fela. Oh, Fela. Most, most happy Fela. Fe- most happy Fela. Gado. Gado. <laughs> it was the best. It was the best musical I'd seen at the end of Act One. Yeah. yeah. But by it the really end of Act Two, it was no longer the best. Well, musical producers I'd seen. of Fela take heed because it is so fabulous the music that they really could have something if they cut twenty. And a great star. Yeah. As well. But isn't Short, that true? Every, Shorter's every, better. Everybody sh- in the theater should take their lead from Yasmina Reza, who figured out a long time ago. With the God of Carnage and art, you write 90 minutes. 90 minutes. Plays. Cut 20 Absolutely. minutes of everything. With, you have. with at least one, one scene of projectile vomiting <laughs> <laughs> on stage. Right. Yes, on stage. not from the audience. We, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap it up, but first, we have a very special announcement and a surprise for one of our panelists who's on the hot seat. It is Jesse oh Green. Oh, Happy, Happy birthday to you. Didn't I see the scene in Next Happy to Normal? Happy birthday <laughs> to <laughs> you. But you're dead. Happy birthday, dear Jesse. She throws the Happy birthday to you. No projectile vomit, All Michael. Right. <laughs> so, well, thank you. The Blow sincerity your... is overwhelming. Blow out your candles, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. Thank All you. Right. So much. I don't get all, all right. these references. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take a cupcake. <laughs> Jesse Green from New York Magazine, Michael Musto from The Village Voice, and Patrick Pacheco from New York One and the bankrupt LA Times. Amen. Take a cupcake so you can eat. <laughs> Thanks for being on. It wasn't my fault. Tonight on Theater Talk. Great. Yeah. See you Thanks. next season. Nice. I'm sure your son is not a savage. Of course, Benjamin isn't a savage. Yes, he is. Alan. Why <laughs> <laughs> say something like that? He's a savage. Well, how does he explain his behavior? He doesn't want to discuss it. But he ought to discuss it. He ought to do any number of things. He ought to come here. He ought to discuss it. He ought to be sorry for it. Clearly, you have parenting skills that put us to shame. We hope to improve, but in the meantime, please bear with us. And as promised, we are joined tonight by Matthew Warchus, who just won the Tony Award for his terrific work as the director of The God of Carnage. He beat himself because he was also nominated for his equally brilliant work on the Norman Conquests. And he's been on Broadway with Boeing, Boeing, and Art, and a very fine revival of True West several years ago. Welcome to Theater Talk, Matthew. Thank and you congratulations. Much. Thank you. So is this a dream come true, having this Tony Award now? Um, well, it was a lovely night. It was a it was a great time. Mm-hmm. You have to you have to tread a, an interesting sort of uh, path between uh, excitement and being thrilled and telling yourself it doesn't matter because <laughs> if you've if you've been nominated as many times as I have and not won, that's what you've been doing for the last uh, ten years. So um, do you know it's just been great to be doing these shows. I mean, I, I'm actually including Boeing Boeing because in the last year I've been here more than I've been away. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, You're a Broadway director now. Yeah, that's right. And my, don't my family know it back home? <laughs> so um, I think that you know I've been very lucky. Those are three very uh, exciting, enjoyable shows to work on. I saw a couple of interviews uh, with you before the Tonys came out, and everyone put this question to you: Were you worried since you were nominated for one and nominated for the other that uh, you'd cancel yourself out? Yeah, I assumed that that was quite likely. Really? Yeah. Um, and then I thought it would be okay because everyone would come up to me afterwards and say, oh, you know, you were robbed, you, 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 you deserved it, and that would be just as good. You should have tied yourself. <laughs> Did you vote for him for, for which one? I, I, I voted, uh, well, well, we'll reveal, I voted for you for God of Carnage because I thought that, as much as I lo- love the Norman Conquest, I thought you had taken four actors from sort of different worlds, Gandolfini from television and Marsha from the stage and the movies and Jeff Daniels from the stage and the movies and Hope, who hadn't been on stage in quite a while from the movies, and blended these four diverse actors into a terrific, coherent ensemble. So that's why I See, I voted for Norman Conquest because you had melded together these three plays and it was so marvelously choreographed. So there you go. Which one do you think you should have won for? Well, it's interesting because, I mean, I think I... From my point of view, I did the same job on ah. both of them, mm. and um, but I did it three times on Norman Conquest, yeah, right. and uh, but it's not ex- it's never exactly the same job. It's abs- of course it's impossible to say. And also, what is the award for? Is it for the amount of hard work you did, or it's, it's so difficult to define directing, you know? And uh, sometimes you can do a very sort of magical, uh, alchemical job with a bunch of actors that you can only manage to do because of the actors are so great or the script is so great. Uh, and other times you can work like crazy and do some fantastic directing but not actually result in a brilliant pr- production because mm. something was flawed or holding you back in the script. Yeah. So you do some great directing 
um, and, and not get a good result. I asked your cast in the uh, press room after the Tony Awards, after they won for Best Revival, uh, Norman Conquest, what you brought to the table. So first, Stephen Mangan, who played Norman, said, well, he hires the best looking actors in town. <laughs> but then they said that you, that you left them alone to be creative in a way that you, you had this way of, of, of setting up the ambience and then just letting them be. You know, it's not uh, an original thing to say, but an awful lot of directing is in the casting. Yes. And uh, I took an immense amount of time to cast uh, Norman Conquests uh, in the UK. And, uh, and I, you know, for example, we would cast one actor and cast another actor five, six weeks later and then build from there. So you're looking for this elusive thing called chemistry, that when it works you have a hit and when it doesn't you generally have a flop in the theatre. I think it's true, and um, to a certain extent. And, and, but if you look at the, these plays, they're so I knew that both of these plays are uh, no, no individual in either God of Carnage or Norman Conquest can give a really special performance without being completely dependent on the others. Yes. Uh, certainly true of God of Carnage because they don't leave the stage. They're just trapped for 90 minutes together yeah. and they're just <coughs> bouncing off each other. And, and directing that play is all about manip manipulating the focus, controlling the focus, so that the audience gets uh, equal time or equal valued moments with each performer. Um, so people who can work together complement each other without, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to cast two people who are too similar. Uh, people who might fit together very well is not always what you're looking for, which is why you might see a kind of well, you mentioned it, a kind of divergence of types in God of Carnage. Physically, in, in God of Carnage, mm -hmm. they're, they are all com from completely different universes. They are. They're like different instruments who yeah. play a different tune. And uh, Norman Conquest, to a certain extent, that's true as well. And uh, if you look, it's in the writing, but you want to emphasize it with the casting. Mm -hmm. and, then you, and then you really try to find people with the right kind of temperament that can... Uh, well, for both these plays, it's quite interesting because I, I, I've cast people who are innately funny, but... Uh, supremely capable of being very serious and deep at the same time and which is a bit like the script the scripts are uh, both funny and uh, sad or savage or whatever it is the opposite mm -hmm. at different times so uh, this sort of um, uh, what you might call a, a hybrid type of writing a hybrid type of actor uh, harness them together and then when you direct them you just say to them uh, be true be more true be uglier, be sadder, make it worse. And because they are innately comic, there's no risk that you're going to drown the uh, plays in darkness, mm. uh, but you're going to flesh out, you're going to fill out the shadow all the time, and the comedy will look after itself. So in The God of Carnage, you would say to that cast, you'd be even more savage. I mean, really go after make her in a worse. nasty way. Yeah. And, but, and you will get the laugh, even though you don't think Well, this was very interesting, because I would be saying to them, uh, that no, we can't do it like that. That looks like something from a play. I want it to look like the worst, most private argument you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, fight, and the thing is that the, the audience uh, really gets off on seeing something that's played uh, for private. It's easy, actually, easier for Norman Conquest because it's in the round, and so the privacy comes for free. Mm -hmm. The actors can't turn to the audience and and. Uh, play to an audience because they're surrounded all, on all sides, they're going to play with each other. Mm -hmm. And that creates a sense of privacy. But I had to superimpose that on the cast of God of Carnage and to keep all of them away from the proscenium march mm -hmm. and for serving it out and just to play to each other, make it more direct, to not play that beat that might be something that's very funny, but it's the wrong kind of funny. Right. It's interesting that you say that because each of the actors in God of Carnage, they all have one moment I can think of, which is sort of supreme physical comedy bit. Gandolfini just raises his finger over the eye and gets a huge laugh. Marsha Gay Harden has a leap across the stage. Uh, Jeff Daniels has a bit with a bottle of rum. <laughs> and Hope Davis but, uh, vomits. <laughs> and Hope Davis vomits. But is there always the danger that when those laughs take off, when you're not around, the actors can indulge it and push it a little farther to make the laugh even bigger? Well, you see, um, apart from the vomit, of course, which is a set piece, um, the, uh, all of those things were rehearsed without being able to predict whether there would be laughs or not. So they were all just rehearsed for situational truth. They are accidents, in a, in a way. And, uh, so, and then an audience meets the production and previews, and the audience decides where to laugh. And they're very inconsistent, which is one of the great things, is that if you go on different nights, um, you will see that the laughs are in different places. 
and only a few of them are consistent. And that's great, because that's very healthy. That mm -hmm. keeps the actors on their toes. If they can't rely on a laugh being exactly there, of that size, then all they've got to fall back on is just playing truthfully with each other. And there'll be a laugh somewhere around there in the vicinity of that moment, but it does, it's not a lock. Mm. And when there is a lock, as you say, there is a problem sometimes can develop. And I go in and I, you know, I point out, they're, they're really rigorous, this cast. They really know what we all want the show to be and what we don't want it to be. And you know, if any of them starts doing shtick, the other three suffer. Right. Because they're left on stage, what do we do if yeah. that's happening? Yeah. And so, you know, on, on behalf of each other, they, they, uh, they avoid that. You have four in Carnage, four celebrities, really, four big stars. Can you give me a sense as a director, do you have to kind of analyze each one of them psychologically to figure out how you're going to get this out of Gandolfini, this out of Jeff Daniels, this out of Marsha, and this out of Hope Davis? Do you have to sort of size them up as people before you begin to play around with the performances? Yeah, you do that with every actor, actually, with every, with every show. You have to, as a director, I think, I'd describe, you just have to learn the language of the actor and speak to each actor in their, in, communicate with them in their own language. For example, with James Gandolfini, I know from talking to him, he felt in the beginning he was quite far behind the other cast members. How do you bring him along? With him, it was very interesting because um, he hadn't done enough plays to realize that he wasn't uh, in any way behind the other three. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just an experience yeah, in the rehearsal yeah, studio. Yeah, I, I said, you, you, what well, you don't realize is, uh, is that it's always crap uh, for a while <laughs> in rehearsals, <laughs> and, uh, and that's normal. And uh, so it's fine. He's, I mean, they, they all are, um, yeah, they, they all have very high standards in their own way, and which is brilliant. And it means that they get, can get frustrated if they're not achieving what they want to do as quickly as they want to achieve it. Mm. And that's completely understandable and, 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 and great, actually. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't want to get rid of all of the creative frustration because not knowing or getting stuck is sort of the exciting thing that happens just before something brilliant. We had the actress here on, um, on Theatre Talk, and they, they all behaved as they do in the play, right, in, in real life. But I was impressed with Marcia, Marcia, because she she strikes me as being the kind of actor who comes in pretty well on top of it and prepared from the beginning. Well, in a way, she was prepared, but you can't really prepare for the style, for the detail of this, of this particular kind of writing. So it's hard to uh, explain what I mean by that, but suffice to say that she had to deconstruct all of her preparation, pe preparation oh, in order to do it, which, you know, she's, apps, she's a genius. They all are. I think they're very, very special actors, and she was completely, courageously willing to, to throw, throw everything out, out everything that she thought about the play. How interesting. And the, and the character. All right, well, terrific work on Broadway this year, both with uh, The Norman Conquests and The God of Carnage, for which Matthew Warchus just won the Tony Award. Congratulations. Thank you. And we'll see you in New York very soon, I'm sure, with a, another winner. I look forward to it. Okay. This year, we sent Andrew Andrew of East Village Radio fame to the Tony Red Carpet, so let's see what they came up with. Hi, this is Andrew and Andrew. Right now, the red carpet's been laid, the lights are up, the fashion is happening for a theater talk here at the Tony Awards. What do you think about the closing of Broadway? It's closing. Well, they closed the street down. Oh, God. I'm like, wait a minute. I'm on a Broadway show. It can't be closed. Well, when I saw the lawn chairs, I was pretty disappointed, but I'm told that they're only temporary and there's going to be something prettier. But it looked pretty chintzy. You haven't sat in the chair yet? No, there's never a chair available. And I have sat uh, satin. It's pronounced satin. You I, did? I, I done did satin. sat in one of those chairs and just took it all in because I'm like, I don't know how long this is going to last. Does that it seems cost like mine to sit in those chairs? Mm -hmm, $40 for 12 minutes. I'm not paying that. No, it doesn't. And doesn't it's kind of nice to sit in lounge chairs in that Times Square area. Have you sat in the chair? Yeah, I've sat in the chairs. We're, have you sat in the chair? No, I don't want to sit in those lawn chairs. What movie would you want to see made into a Broadway show? Any movie? Transform. <laughs> Any casting ideas? <laughs> casting ideas? I would be in it. Oh, the story of Harriet's life. <laughs> I think. I would play Harriet. Not me. Uh, no, I'd, I'd be play, terrible. I'm playing you. you. You'd be much better yeah, at me. You could then. play your sister. I could do the life story of Janet McTeer. That would be <laughs> far more saucy. I think a, 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 an all drag mommy dearest would be phenomenal. I guess CBS has decided not to show some of the creative awards because of the length of the show. What do you think, what are you looking forward to as far as the non-creative awards? What do you mean non-creative? That's what we're trying to figure out. Oh, I see, creative? sorry. Yeah, I get your point. 
<laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. I think, I, I don't know, like Kevin Spacey, I think they should show it all on PBS. And just, I, like I can't think of anything that isn't creative. Well, you know, I think dullest use of uh, scenery. Um, I'm looking for, that's a tight race. Um, and also um, least interesting props. Art, these are all artists and they're all our peers. And whether they show them or not, I am looking forward to seeing each and every one of them. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. Playbill Online is the official website of Theatre Talk and the home of the Playbill Club, providing information and opportunities for theatre lovers. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>